Yeah, now, yeah, now we're on. And uh, sounds, sounds going, so. Is it crunchy? I Yeah, there's, she brought in some cinnamon rolls. No, I don't. You gonna eat your banana now? That's good. It's good and healthy for you. back, right? We're back. We're bad. I don't know if I'd say that. Yeah. Yeah, we, we missed it. We missed it two years here. I'm trying to remember what weekend it was. But yeah. Was it the first weekend in November? <coughs> or the second weekend? So it was the fifth. So it was that first weekend then. <clears throat> yeah. Oh yeah. The two year anniversary of actually being here. Huh? Yeah, Bruce's Bruce's two year anniversary is coming up in January, right? Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. I just want you to know, uh, all of you, you mean the world to us. Yeah. Everybody. Yeah. yeah. And there, <laughs> you know, um, I don't know who all is on Facebook too, but you know, it's just one of those things. Like, you you start you start to look back, and it doesn't seem that we like we've been meeting for what four years now, five five, five. five years. And two years that we've been meeting in this room, um, so yeah, it's it's kind of wild to think that it's you don't think that it's been that long, but it this has. Was, this was a really good bond for you, so I'm glad yeah. that, that you were yeah. able to, to find it. <coughs> well, yeah. yeah. As long as it's open. Yeah. yeah. Now don't feel like y'all have to come. That's just something. The internet will work here. I mean, feel free to come. Yeah, yeah. Bruce, Bruce is like, you all going this Wednesday? I was like, probably not this Wednesday, but. Well, no, you're fine. Um, but no, Wednesday nights. I, I was talking to Jared. Delilah had talked to him before, and so um, they're going to let us use this room on Wednesday nights as long as nobody else is using it uh, for free. Uh, so that's pretty awesome. Yeah. Are you still going to be up there using the whiteboard, or are you going to probably? Probably, because I want to. I want to start Matthew or Daniel. I'm still not sure which one I'm going to do first. Matthew. Bruce says Matthew, so this isn't a voting thing. But no, I was joking. <laughs> I'm thinking Matthew as well. But uh, when when we were up in Ohio, Ted Ted and I were talking about some stuff, and he said uh, he's wanting to go through. Um, he's wanting to take. Uh, Daniel chapter 2 and Daniel chapter 9 and kind of overlay it on the chart and kind of show where some things go with that stuff and how Matthew fits in and, and stuff like that. And I told him, I said, you know, I've thought about us doing a not end of times thing. You know how we did the through the Bible? Oh, you feel this room up. I know. And I told him, I said, if we did something to do with rapture or, you know, something like that, the room would be full, but I told him, I said, what I'd be worried about are some nut jobs to show up. Oh, you already did that. Well, I know, but like 
real, real nut jobs. Yeah, but so I don't know. I've thought about doing that. So you know, like we did the the through the Bible in seven hours, six hours. Uh, um, but uh, that is true. Um, but that was something I thought about doing. But I told him I said I'd be worried about who would show up. Um, and cause problems. Yeah. That's what I'd be worried about. And then they wouldn't care. And they wouldn't care if we were doing something live or not. Um, just because they'd want to cause trouble. But I don't know. That, that's one thing that I thought would be really neat. But yeah, this place would be full. And we'd have to do like various sections over and over again. But I don't know. But. Uh, so I'm thinking, I'm thinking we'll probably start Matthew on Monday night, and uh, we'll be able to use the board that way too. So we'll see what happens. Wednesday night. Okay. Yeah. Oh yeah. Now still Wednesday night, and we'd we'd do the seven o'clock to eight. I mean, we could do six to seven. That's fine. Whatever you want to do, I'm I'm good with. I mean, we both get off. I don't leave school till about 4.30 now anyway, so we could. Yeah. Well, I know, I know one reason we did 7 o'clock was where Mike doesn't get home till almost 7, and so we that's no, one that, reason. That, that was before. It's different. Okay. All right. I'm, I'm usually home before 5. Oh, okay. Because uh, that was one thing that we did before because you were asking if we could do it at 7 because you'd be at home at 7, so. Yeah, we could do six if that's if that's fine. We could do six to seven. Does that work? Yeah. Um, she used to have a kid that was there till about six fifteen, six thirty. Mm -hmm. Then at one time she had a kid that was there till about eight. But now they're all gone by five thirty. Okay. Yeah, I think Yeah. So we could do we could do six to seven then. Yeah. All right. So this Wednesday, this Wednesday night, we'll start. Um, the book of Matthew, and earlier, where, where it's earlier, that'd probably help you out too, because I don't know what time you get off work, but, um, okay, I'd hate for you to just hang around Georgetown or Frankfurt for three hours, okay, <clears throat> all right, uh, so that'll be, that'll be Wednesday night, we'll do six o'clock, hang out with all the little toddlers, that's what I do, uh, hang out with <laughs> <laughs> All right. <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> All right. So Titus. Um, yeah. So Titus chapter one. I think this is the ninth part to chapter one. The thirteenth part overall, maybe, or twelfth part overall. Um, <clears throat> sure, what you got? Be like last year, the year before? Yeah. We'll be there. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, Titus chapter 2. Uh, we've gone down through, um, at least at least gone through verse 3, and we, we started talking about some stuff in verse 4 last week. Um, <clears throat> so what I want to do, let's... Uh, we're going to read verses 1 through 5, and then we'll get going. All right, so Titus chapter 1, <clears throat> verse 1 uh, through verse 5. Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledging of the truth, which is after godliness, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began, but hath in due times manifested his word through preaching, which is committed unto me according to the commandment of God our Savior 
to Titus, my own son, after the common faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. For this cause left I thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting, and ordain elders in every city, as I had appointed thee. Father, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to study your word. As we open up the, the book of Titus and we take a look at the information that uh, you're conveying to us, uh, may we open our hearts and ears and mind to what your word says and allow it to be the final authority in all things that uh, we might be to the praise and honor and glory of your son Jesus Christ and it's in his name we pray amen <clears throat> so as we get through uh, the first first three verses really what we were dealing with is the fact that uh, we now we now have an idea of what it means that Paul is saying where he's a servant of God uh, we, we've we've dealt with the the fact that he's the apostle of Jesus Christ one of the things one of the things that you get into with this that that we've kind of taken a stand on in the past is Paul has a unique apostleship right and we've we've talked about this before why were there 12 apostles for the nation of Israel is because there were 12 tribes and they then Christ told them that they were going to sit on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel they were going to have their own gate in that kingdom um, all the things that we've talked about with that and so then you, you, you come to the question and say, why Paul? All right, so that's the question that, that a lot of church, churches out there can't answer, um, is why, why does Paul show up? All right, we, we've demonstrated before he's not the replacement for Matthias, and the reason why is because he didn't fit the qualifications to be one of the twelve. Uh, so then why do you have this one apostle? Well, we've also talked about the fact that what God's doing today, Ephesians chapter 4, talks about the fact that there's, um, that there's one Lord, one faith, one baptism. And, you know, you go through all the ones there. Over in, in 1 Corinthians 12, you've got the fact that there is the body of Christ. We know that the body of Christ began with Paul. And one of the things about, one of the special things about the, the body of Christ is you have Jews and Gentiles. Uh, that God's declared all under sin that he might have mercy upon all. And then you look at the fact that, hey, Paul was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He was the tribe of Benjamin, but he was also a freeborn Roman. So you technically have a Jew and a Gentile in that one body that was saved on the road to Damascus. And you step back and you think, that has to be a God type of thing, you know? When you think about those types of things, that's not just a, a happenstance or a coincidence. Um, there's something that was going on with that. And so then, of course, he has that, that unique apostleship and all the things that go along with that, right? And the fact that I was listening to a guy this morning on the radio and he said uh, the, the, the biblical way to do baptism is by dunking. It's full immersion. And, you know, you go back in the Old Testament, you find out it's actually sprinkling. That's the baptism that they had. Um, you didn't have immersion. But that just... Anyway, you start thinking of some of those things. And there's, there's a, um, a lady at school that I work with. She was telling me about a young man in there that uh, he was wanting to be baptized. And she said, you might want to have a conversation with him. And I said, well, I'm probably not the person that he needs to talk to if he wants to be baptized because we don't baptize. So she's like, why don't you all do it? And I was, so I explained to her some of the reasons why. <clears throat> and uh, I was like, I'd be happy to talk to him. Um, and we can we can actually go through and show some verses and stuff, but um, it's not happened yet. But <clears throat> so she she came over and she's like, "Why don't you all immerse?" I'm like, "Well, let's let's take a look at some reasons why." Um, but it, it's little things like that that we we kind of take a stand on because that's unique to Paul and his apostleship. Um, you know, with the uh, the rapture of the church. We know that that's something that's unique to Paul, right? You don't find that anywhere else other than, other than Paul's epistles. So little things like that make a big difference. So when Paul starts off here, he says, A servant of God, an apostle of Jesus Christ. Notice it's according to the faith of God's elect. And if you remember, we talked about that. It's the, the God's elect there was Jesus Christ. And so it's according to Jesus Christ, what you're looking at there. That, that is who is God's elect in the passage. And the acknowledgement of the truth, which is after godliness. So we, we get to see some things here as we go down through in this, this self-righteousness that we get to put away. Um, 
Delilah and I had a guy that I know, um, Mike shared a, a, a picture, the coexist thing, right? So I shared it, and then a, a friend of mine um, made some comments on it and said, well, I think the point of that is that we could all coexist if these religions didn't exist. And I think that we should be able to, you know, just do good without God. Or, and he put God in quotations. And um, So he, he, he said a few things like that. And he's like, I think we should just be able to be nice to each other and, and, you know, not judge each other and stuff like that. I told Delilah, I said, I was talking to him yesterday. And he's literally judging a person in front of me because of something that they were doing. I was like, shouldn't we just coexist? Can't you just do good without God? I'm sitting there thinking, I was like, you're talking out of both sides of your mouth. And you're self-righteous because you're putting this other person down because, you know, they're doing something that you wouldn't do. I was like, that's the exact opposite of what you said that you would do. So, you know, you always kind of see, you know, when they say the, uh, by the fruit of their, by their fruit, you'll know them, you know. So then you just sit around and talk, listen to the guy for a few minutes. Like, you don't really believe what you say you believe, and that's okay, you know. I'll move on. Um, and I didn't say anything to him. I was like, man, I, I kind of wanted to bring that up, but I didn't. Um, but that, that, that acknowledging of the truth, which is after godliness, what that does is that godliness allows you to just put away that self-righteous stuff, right? Um, which so many people are always trying to put themselves up on a pedestal, and that's what that is. And what godliness does is you find out it's not you, it's him. It's Christ living his life through you. And that's all it has to do with. And then we can look at life a whole lot differently. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but it, it goes back to that, that self-righteous type stuff. like, And it, it is what it is. But, you know, that, that's the idea is as we take a look at this, we allow, you know, just acknowledge. And you see there he says the acknowledging of the truth, which is after godliness. Um, then he says, he continues on, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world again. We talked about that. It said God made a promise to himself before he created the world that he was going to do what he's doing exactly today, right? And so we've mentioned it before. The, the dispensation of the grace of God is not plan B. It's not an alternate plan that God had to come up with all of a sudden at the last second when they stoned Stephen. This is something he planned and he promised before the foundation of the world that he would give unto us eternal life. And one of the things we talked about on Wednesday night, the last Wednesday night we were on, eternal life is knowing God, Right? When you talk about death, what is death? Death's not just the cessation of life, but it's separation from God. And what eternal life is, is knowing God and not being disconnected from Him. And that's really what that eternal life that He's dealing with there. Basically, you think about this. Basically, what God said is He says, I want to promise to myself that I'm going to give these people out here my life so that, I, that, they, can, that they can dwell with me forever. Because you think we, whether you're whether you're dead or alive, whether you're saved or not, you're going to live forever. <coughs> it's either eternal life or eternal death. <coughs> Both of them last forever. There's no end to it. You know when 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 you go through and he's talking about the worm that dieth not. That doesn't end. That death does not end forever. And so life that we have is knowing God, that's something that we also have forever. And that's something that he promised to us. Well, he promised himself that he would give it to us if we believe. Uh, in verse 3 he says, But hath in due times manifested his word through preaching, which is committed unto me according to the commandment of God our Savior. If that verse doesn't let people know that what Paul teaches is different than everybody else, I don't know what else will, right? When he says, hath in due times manifested his word through preaching, which is committed unto me. 
All right, so the preaching that he has is committed unto him in a due time, right? So we talked about um, really what you're dealing with there is God promised back here eternal life, right? And what happens is there is a time where it's due time for that information to be relayed, and who is it relayed to is Paul. Right? That's the idea. Was it, was it time to, re, to reveal this any time prior to this? When you think about that phrase, due time. Right? We talked about this the last time, so this is just kind of bringing us up in our minds. When you talk about due time, when you've got a bill, your bill has a due date. Right? When that comes due, you now owe whatever it is it's due, right? Now you think about, do you really owe anything, all that stuff, and I understand that, so this might be a horrible thing, but when you think about a due time, there is a time that God set out before the foundation of the world. He said, there is a time period when I'm going to reveal that information. And prior to that, it was completely kept secret, right? We looked at the verses, um, Acts chapter 3, 19, 20 in there. He's talking about the fact that, that Peter is preaching the things that were spoken of by his, by his holy prophets since the world began. And then in, in Romans 16, 25, 26, he says, here's the information, here's some stuff that's been taught that's been kept secret since the world began. So when the world began, there were two different things. One was preached, and the other one was kept secret. Whoops back here and it wasn't revealed until it was time to be revealed right and that's that's the idea of what we're talking about here he says but in but hath in due times manifested his word through preaching which is committed unto me according to the commandment of god our savior so god created a god had a commandment that he was going to reveal some information to and through the apostle paul now we can talk about the fact that he says but hath in due times did God give Paul the entire revelation of the mystery all at once? No. We understand that there is a progressive revelation to that, and there would be due times that he was going to reveal that. So that doesn't trip us up at all. So when we get to verse 4, we finally get to the person that he's writing the book to, right? Here we've got he's writing to Titus, the man for whom this book is titled notice he says to Titus mine own son after the common faith now this is something that we looked at the last time go over to First Timothy chapter 1 and uh, get Second Timothy chapter 1 <clears throat> First Timothy chapter 1 Verse 1 says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ, which is our hope, unto Timothy, my, my own son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So we see here in verse 2, who does, what's he call Timothy there is his son where? In the faith. Second uh, Timothy chapter 1. Verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, according to the promise of life which is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and, and Christ Jesus our Lord. So we see here, what does he say? To Timothy, my dearly beloved son. All right? Now, when we get over here, you notice in Titus chapter 1, verse 4, he says, To Titus, mine own son, after the common faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father, our Father and Lord Jesus Christ our Savior. Is there something that you all noticed in there, other than the fact that he would mentioned that both of them were his son, really in the faith, and it wasn't his biological son, because we've talked about already. For most accounts, most people, and I tend to agree with this, that Paul was probably a bachelor. Right? He wasn't married. Um, that's personal preference, not preference, but that's personal understanding that I have that he would have not been married. And uh, we, could, we could talk about that some other time, but is there anything else that we notice there other than the fact that he calls them, their, their, he calls them his son? 
Do we notice anything else there that's common in all three of those verses? Huh? What else? All right, so we've got the faith, right? And then you also, and this is, this is one of those, we've talked about this before, right? In, in Paul's epistles, most of the time, he's, he says what? Grace and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. He says that in pretty much every one of his epistles. Uh, and then we get over here to 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus, and he, then he changes it up and says, Grace, mercy, and peace. Right? And so it's kind of interesting to me that it's found in all three of those um, that he's writing to these young men that, that he considers his son in the faith, right? So there's a few things that we want to make sure that we point out here. Um, let's go over real quick. Uh, we've, already, we've already looked at the one. Go to, uh, go to, uh, go to Philippians chapter 3 real quick. <clears throat> Um, Philippians chapter 3 and uh, we'll, we'll take a look at some, some things here that's, 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 that's pretty interesting I think <clears throat> Philippians chapter 3 uh, I'll start off here in verse, uh, verse 1 it says finally my brethren rejoice in the Lord to write the same things to you to me indeed is not grievous but for you it is safe Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of concision. I think I, think I need to make a face, Facebook group that that that's the verse. Verse 2. Verse two. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of concision. For we are the circumcision which worship God in the Spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I am more circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel and the tribe of Benjamin, an Hebrew of the Hebrews, heresy, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. So when we see here, what do we notice about Paul? Paul's what? He's a Jew, right? Go over to go over to uh, Galatians chapter two. <clears throat> Galatians chapter two. Uh, start off in verse one. Galatians chapter two, verse one. Then fourteen years after. I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took Titus with me also. So we see here, Titus is here. So one of the things we've already talked about is Paul, Paul, I need to find a better word for use, but Paul used Titus to do some things, right? We talked about this before. Um, in, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17, it says, For all Scripture is given by inspiration, right? And it's profitable. It's given by inspiration to God and it's profitable. For what? Doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness. So we've already talked about the fact that Paul had, had Titus to be able to preach doctrine. He also used Titus to be able to um, reprove bad behavior. So we looked at the things that he helped him out with in Corinth. And then he was also able to correct bad doctrine. We see here how he's going to use him in Galatia to help correct that bad doctrine that they were trying to put themselves under the law because somebody came along and says, hey, you've got to keep the law. In fact, you need to be circumcised after the manner of Moses, and if you don't, then you're not saved. Um, so then we see here how he uses Titus to do that, and then, of course, the instruction in righteousness. Titus over there, and he says, I left you in Crete for this purpose, right, to do something. So when we see, that's, that's, that's one of those issues, hopefully, that we keep in mind as we go through dealing with Titus. Notice in chapter, uh, chapter 2, verse 1, he says, Then 14 years after... I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took Titus with me also. I went up by revelation and communicated unto them that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles. Now I want you to think about that real quick. Verse 2 where he says, and I went up by revelation. Did he just 
by his own whim decide, hey, I want to go up to Jerusalem and talk to them. He went up by revelation. When we talk about the fact that the risen Lord appeared to Paul, Saul, on the road to Damascus, and then he had subsequent revelations, and you, you, you read up in, in chapter 1 there, he talks about the fact that, it was, that the gospel that he preached was by revelation of Jesus Christ. This was something that Christ is, you know, we, we always talk about, everybody says, well, I want to follow Christ. And that's one reason why this woman is like, you know, most people want to follow Christ in baptism. Well, there are zero verses in Scripture that tell you to follow Christ in baptism. And in fact, what happens is, is Christ, through Paul, tells us that there's a different baptism that he's got going on today than what he had going on in, in the time past. And we see those things. So when we see what's going on here, Jesus Christ is, is putting his stamp of approval on what Paul's doing, saying, I want you to go to Jerusalem. And he, by revelation, goes up to Jerusalem. Right? It's not because he wanted to go fuss and fight with somebody. It's because Christ was wanting to make sure that everybody knew, hey, things are changed. Right? And we see this. <clears throat> Um, and I went up by revelation and communicated unto them that gospel which I preached among the Gentiles, but privately to them which were of reputation, lest by any means I should run or had run in vain. And notice in verse 3, but, ne but neither Titus, who was with me, being a what? So what you have here is you have Paul, who is a what? All right, we just found out that he was a Jew. We also know he was a freeborn Roman. And Titus, we find out that he's a what? A Gentile, a Greek, right? So I want you to think about this real quick. Um, he says, um, but neither Titus who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. So when we go back to, when we go back to Titus, <clears throat> when we go back to Titus, chapter 1, verse 4, and he says, to Titus, mine own son, after the common faith, was it possible during this time back here for a Jew and a Gentile to have a common faith? So, you got to think. So, you have a Jew and a Gentile over here who have a common faith that they both share only if they converted right so there was some sort of thing that you would have to do um, when we think about that 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 has to tell us that there's some sort of dispensational change that kind of makes sense for them for them to be for them to be is there anything is there anything in scripture that tells us that Titus became a Jew I mean the fact that he didn't get circumcised tells us what what was going on back here wasn't the thing, right? And that's the point in the book of Galatians is is no, no, no longer a thing that you need to worry about. In fact, <clears throat> um, go, back, go back over. Um, Go back over to Galatians real quick. In, in, in Galatians chapter 2, um, we'll, I'm going to take a look at something else. Galatians chapter 2, um, where we just were shortly after that, notice, notice down in um, down verse... We'll start in verse 13. Um, Galatians chapter 2, verse 13. And the other Jews dissembled likewise with him, insomuch that Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimulation. All right, so we're talking about uh, some things that were going on there. Uh, verse 14. But when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter before them all, If thou, being a Jew, livest after the manner of Gentiles, and not as do the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? So if that verse, 
you know, we, we can talk about these all the time. If that verse doesn't let you know that there is a difference, <laughs> then I don't know what else I can give you to, con to convince you that things are different now. And he's saying, and you keep on going, verse 15, we who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. So when you think about what's going on, you had these religious people. You've got to think back. When, when Paul is talking about in, in the book of Romans chapter 11, he's, he's going through chapter 10, 9, 10, and 11. He's going through that stuff. And at the end of chapter 9, he's talking about the fact that they're going to try and go and establish their own righteousness by performing works, right? And it wasn't just by the law, but they were adding in their traditions and they're saying because so-and-so has always done it this way, this tradition that was written down in the book, we're going to follow that tradition, right? So not only were they trying to fulfill the law, but they were also trying to fulfill a tradition which God never gave them, right? I mean, you look at the... The Roman Catholic Church today, they put Father So-and-So's words above Scripture. And if what he says is different than what Scripture says, then they go by his words and not Scripture. Right? And that's one of the reasons why they didn't want the, the Bible in, in the language of the people, so they wouldn't be able to know that that's not what the Bible says. Um, you worry about that stuff and you think about that stuff and people are just fine and dandy being in that system. And we say, more power to you. We're going to keep on walking. Um, but what he's doing there is, there, that's what these religious people were saying is, well, you need to keep the law and you need to be circumcised after the manner of Moses. Well, the scary thing is when you've got Peter and those guys showing up saying, well, you all need to, you all need to do this. And so then that's exactly what he's talking about there. He says, there's n in, knowing, in verse 16, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. And again, that phrase, the faith of Jesus Christ, is very important. Right? We've talked about before. Is it possible? Is it possible for the faith of Christ that was shown back there on the cross can... Can, can he undo that? His faith was put on display and demonstrated not just in his life but on the cross. And if it's his faith, does his faith change? As I said, can you undo this? The answer is no. So when we look at this and it says it's by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we... Uh, even we have believed in Jesus Christ. That's our faith that we might be justified again by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no, sh no, f no flesh be justified. So what happens is we're going to start finding out that this faith that he's talking about takes us back to that. Right? And one of the things that I find very interesting is... Paul refers to the faith, the common faith, all this, when he's talking about that, that faith is the body of doctrine that was delivered to him. Right? Now, and, and I've said that for years and I agree with that statement. But what does that body of truth have to do with is the faith of Christ. So when we start seeing what that body of truth has to do with is it's all based on what? Christ did his faith to do what he did now as we as we take a look at this uh, those are some of those things that we need to make sure that we see um, go get uh, go get Ephesians chapter 2 this is this is a passage of scripture that we're really really familiar with in Ephesians chapter 2 now the the main thing we'll, we'll talk about the grace, mercy, and peace, too. But I want to focus on that common faith, the faith there. Um, and how it's, how it's a little bit different than anything taught before, right? In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 14. Well, verse 13. Um, 
And of course, we know this is this is right right in the middle of of the the passage that that we show from Scripture how to write the divide. Verse thirteen says, "But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were afar off, are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For He is our peace, who hath made both one." And who's the both there in the context? Jew and Gentile, circumcision and uncircumcision, right? Who hath made both one? and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. Now, if we go back to the Old Testament, we find out what is that middle wall of partition that separated Jew and Gentile was circumcision. All right? That's the thing that separated them. When, when God gives Abraham that circumcision, says that the eighth day that a child is born in your house, they're going to be circumcised, and that's going to be a token or a sign of the covenant that I've made between you and, 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 me, and myself. And a lot of people come along and say, well, it was the law. Well, the law came after that. And what it did is it fortified that middle wall partition between them. All right, so then you got to think, how, how is it that a Gentile down here, how is a Gentile down here going to be able to become part of that? Is well, they had to go through that wall, right? Yeah. Probably not. More power to us. No, they knew to circumcise before the law. Yeah. Because that's what God gave to Abraham before. So if you go back, because you got to think, <clears throat> when was it that the, that the circumcision was given? It was back in Genesis, right? Genesis 17. Right? You're fine. When was it that the law was given? It was after that, right? So they go into Egypt. They're in Egypt for a long period of time, 400 years. And so then they come out, and in Exodus 19 slash 20, God brings them out of Egypt, and Moses goes up into the mountain, right? And he comes back, and he's got the two tables of stone, he sees everybody down there partying and dancing, and they got their golden calf. You know, you're talking about stamping earlier. Um, I want you to think about this. The nation of Israel coming out of Egypt, they did not have a stamping tool. They did not have a template to go by, but they created this golden calf. You, know, you think about that. How did they do that? How did they create a golden calf? They didn't have anything that they, could, that they could melt all the gold down and then pour it in some form and wait for it to set up and then take the form off. How did they create that? That, that dawned on me a few days ago, and I was like, how did they create this calf? They didn't have a press, right? They, they didn't have some stamping machine. They didn't have a 3D printer. I want you to, I'm sure they had some tools with them, but... Well, they would have needed a mold. They would have, yeah, they would have needed a mold to have created this. It would have been huge. Yeah, and heavy. And very heavy. So how did they do that? I would say it would probably at least be same size, same size as a regular calf or a cow, yeah. Um, but I, you know that that dawned on me the other day to to think about to think about this. God's brought you out of Egypt. He's fed you. He's given you water, right? And he's he's taking you to the promised land. And they're sitting there thinking about man how good it was. Just think, they thought how good they had it back in Egypt. And they worked like dogs, day in, day out. They were whipped if they didn't get the job done. All of a sudden, you know, you go through and you reach, you go back there and you look at what's going on. So God's done all this, brings them out. Moses is gone. He's gone long enough for them to melt down all their gold, create this form, pour the gold in the form, allow it to set up, 
and cool. And then set it up and then start dancing and worshiping. Now I sit back and I look at that and I'm thinking, God's fed you. He's brought you out of a horrible situation. He promised He'd bring you out. And He's bringing you out. He's feeding you. He's giving you water. He's giving you everything that you need. And they decide to take it upon themselves that we're going to go do all this work. Give up their valuables. Give up their valuables. Go and, and do all this work to create this calf because that's really the one that they're going to be praying to and dancing around. No wonder Moses was so mad. Mm-hmm. That's why. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, I find it interesting, just as a side note, that gold was referred to all the way back in Genesis 2. It's still important then, mm -hmm. and it's still important today. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thousands and thousands of years, still, and gold still. Yeah. I still read stuff online that talks about different countries buying and selling large sums of gold mm -hmm. for whatever reason and they're still I mean it's still it's not the number it's not the most expensive mm -hmm. metal out there but it's it's always like the metal yeah that all others are based on yeah it's, it's the precious metal it's the precious metal that, that most economies are backed by and that's what makes them have value because it's always, yeah. And so you think about that goes all the way back to to Egypt. I mean, even before then. Um, yeah, that's... Yeah, because I looked it up, because I, I knew it was early in Genesis. But in Genesis 2.11, it says, the name of the first is Python. That is, that is it which com compasses the whole land of Havilah, mm -hmm. where there is gold. Yeah. And the gold of that land is good. And so you go all the way back... That it's talked about that far back. Yeah. Right after the creation. And it's still here. Yeah. And I'm sure that there are places of gold that have not been touched yet, mm. which is kind of odd to think about. Yeah. Nobody's nobody's gotten to it yet. So that's that's a, that's very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, you know, I thought about that the other day. How did they create? No, I mean, and that's that's a good thing, right? So you sit back and you think, how did they come up with it? They they didn't have a mold. It's not like they were carrying around a mold with them. Um, but they created a mold. They're going through doing all this work. And God is saying, all you need to do is just trust me. And they were impatient. You know, one of the things, one of the verses that we talked about over in, um, I think it's First Peter, where, where Peter says, God doesn't count, you know, God doesn't count slackness as, as we would, um, but He's long suffering. We we're not long suffering, especially nowadays. If if I want something and if I don't get it right then, my day's ruined. Like I've got kids at school, like that's that's their thought process. If I don't get it now, I mean, a girl was given a Range Rover. For her 16th birthday. No, no, no. It gets better. She doesn't like it. She wants the new Range Rover with the roof that's glass. And she's making her parents return it and get her a new one. You think about that. That's that's where we've come to now. For her to be the no. I wouldn't, I wouldn't have one of those things if somebody gave it to me. Scotty uh, killed no. her. Speaks very low of them. Yeah. And Scotty knows everything about cars. Everything, everything I've ever heard of them, I, I wouldn't want one. On the internet, it must be true. <laughs> it is. <laughs> but you know that that instant gratification of, and if I'm not if I'm not satisfied, you know, I'm going to keep going until I am, and you're never going to be satisfied. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like fruit isn't good enough. You gotta have 
Yeah. Fruit's not good enough. I want a Snickers. Okay. Or soda. No. Yeah. I mean, not just that. You start thinking about how, what, you know, some of the things that we've got now. Two years ago, you'd have to drive to Wendy's if you wanted to go to Wendy's. Now you don't have to because now you can have that delivered to you by Grubhub or, you know, one of those other things. Um, or DoorDash. DoorDash, there's no reason for you to leave your house anymore. Walmart will deliver it. You know, you, you think about that stuff and... Uber Eats, that's another, that's a new one. Yeah. Yeah, so now you've got, yeah, Grubhub and DoorDash and, and Uber Eats. So you've got all these things that will deliver food for you of places that don't deliver food. So I've actually thought about, hey, I could get me a job with DoorDash or one of those, and then I just go pick up people's food and then take it to them. Yeah, that would be pretty easy. That's what Kroger's does. They use yeah. Something like that. Yeah. 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 But I mean, you know, you think that, that somebody is is unwilling to go pick out their own stuff and then go home. I mean, I understand. You go to Walmart about four seconds out of the vehicle, you're like, I don't want to be here. Right? But you persevere and you, you keep on going. But, you know, you think about that stuff. Yeah, <clears throat> but I mean, you think about you think about where where we are. The fact that they chose to do all this work to create their own little form to be able to do this to take their precious metals and melt them down and create this golden calf and then worship it. Thinking that was the thing that brought them out of Egypt. <clears throat> I don't know how in the world we got over there, but here we go. No, I know what it was. It was that law. It was when the law, right? So, no, you're fine. So back in Ephesians chapter two, right? Uh, that middle wall of partition, verse fourteen, All right? Verse fifteen, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to making himself of twain one new man, so making peace. So in verse fourteen, you see that he breaks down that middle wall of partition, and then not only that, but then he goes in verse. Uh, verse 15 says, I'm going to do away with the law too. Right? And that's the issue that we see here. Why? Verse 16, and that he might reconcile both. Well, who's the both? Jew and Gentile, circumcision and uncircumcision. Unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you which were afar off and to them that were nigh. For through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. None of that could have been said back there. That's part of this due time, the faith, that Paul's talking about over here in Titus, right? That's something that's completely different than over there, right? You could not have preached what Paul's preaching here back there. You could not have a common faith between those two guys because of that middle wall partition back there, right? And that's, that's one of those things that we see. Now, the important thing is you go over to chapter 3, um, Verse 9, Galatians chapter 3, <clears throat> verse 9, and, and we see something else here. Ephesians 3, verse 9 says, And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been what? Where? All right, so this was hid in God. All right, does that say that? that we're to make fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in the Old Testament. Is that what that says? So then when somebody comes along and says, yeah, but you can go back there and you can find all this stuff back in the Old Testament, do you know what you can say? Well, that verse right there tells you it was hidden God, not in the Old Testament. Huh? Yeah. Romans 16 says the exact same thing, right? So what happens is there's something hidden here that we need to make sure that we pay attention to. It's something completely different, something that was never talked about before, but it was completely hid in God back in the, the time past, actually before the time past. Go over to um, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. You know, we see these things over and over again, hopefully, as we go through this stuff. Um, 
hopefully we can we can see these things. First Corinthians chapter two. <clears throat> First Corinthians chapter two, verse six. First Corinthians chapter two, verse six. Christ or Paul says, "Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor the princes of this world that come to naught." And I want to stop there for just a second. When he says there in verse six, he says, "Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect." Who is he talking about there? Who is it? That he says, we speak wisdom among them that are perfect. Who's the perfect there? The body of Christ. The mature members of the body of Christ. He's saying, we're able to talk about these things because it's not milk, it's meat stuff, right? And if, of course, then he's going to go on in chapter 3 talking about, I wish I could talk to you all about meat, but I can't because you're children. And I have to talk to you about milk. All right? So notice in verse... Um, Verse 6, he says, How bit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet thought not the wisdom of this world, nor of the prince of this world. Uh, so when you think it's not the wisdom of the world, or it's not the wisdom of the princes, right? Nor of the princes of this world that come to naught. Do you know what we find out about the wisdom of the world and the wisdom of the princes? They both come to naught, right? But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. Question. Can you know the wisdom of God? Can you understand and know the will of God? Yes. Is God still holding some information back from us? No. So, you know, we've talked about this before. You go back to, to Genesis chapter 3 and what's Satan do? He says, God knows that in the day that you eat thereof, ye shall be as gods, knowing both good and evil. Right? So what Satan is telling them in the garden is, God's holding something back and he's not told you everything yet. There's just some things you just don't know. Right? But when we come here in verse 7, and that's what happens is a lot of churchianity today says, well, we just don't understand God's ways and you know, sister so-and-so just passed away and we just don't understand it yet and one day that we might be able to know it. That's not what that is, right? God's not, God's not, God's not working that way today, right? We know that. But a lot of churches out there, well, you just don't know God. His mysteries, you just leave it up to, to faith. That we'll, just, we'll just believe that He knows what He's doing. It's an easy way for them to not know. And what that comes from is Calvinism, right? And that's why I said the first Calvinist was Satan in the garden, that serpent. So then we come to this, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom of God. So not only are we able to know the wisdom of God, but he's actually revealing to us his hidden wisdom. So if he's given us his wisdom and his hidden wisdom, is there anything else that we need to know? No. So we keep on going. Which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. So when we see what's going on here, one of the things that we see is what? God's not just given us His wisdom today in the dispensation of the grace of God, but He's given us His hidden wisdom. He's revealed everything that He's doing. He's basically said, all this stuff that I hid in myself back here, there is a particular time in which I was going to reveal it, and I've done it. And so you, then you sit back and you think, all right, so what am I supposed to do? Well, we get in the book and we find out what God's doing, right? When we talk about, and I, was, I had a conversation with a guy at school. Um, he graduated seminary, and so we're having conversations, and he, you know, I, I've told Delilah this, and I'd mentioned it at one of the conferences. Um, he said, are you, are you all talking about all that minu Jesus minutia stuff? I was like, I was like um, what do you mean? He's like, we're just supposed to get people saved. And I'm like, okay, well, you go read 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4. That's one of the two things that we're told. And I said, when you read that verse, there's an and after getting people saved. 
And that's bringing them to the knowledge of the truth. And I was like, so what you call minutia, God calls the truth. And part of our job as an ambassador is go and make sure that we teach people the truth. It's not just get people saved, get numbers, get people, get, get warm hind ends and cold pews to get people in to say we've got 14 people. When, when we were up in Ohio, Brother Ted took me to the Christian Hall of Fame. It's in the Baptist church up there. And what they do is they have pictures on both sides of these hallways, and you're walking down these hallways, and it's this person, this person, whoever it is. And uh, there's a bunch of guys um, like John uh, Wycliffe, and um, I can't remember all the people that were there. And Ted was like, let's go see if we can find our picture. And I'm like, we're not there. <laughs> um, Henry Clay, um, that the school's named after, and one of his, he was one of them that was there. So, you know, little things like that. And there's a couple other guys from Paducah, and I don't, you know, it's kind of neat. That... So we're going through there, looking at some of this stuff, and it was like, uh, brother so and so led sixty thousand people to the Lord. So I, I asked Ted, I was like, there's a whole bunch of things that I that kind of rubs me the wrong way on that. One. Who counted that many people? Why would you count? And how do you know that they were actually saved? Right? So you start thinking, and then you look at this other guy, and he's got 40,000. So does that mean this other guy is better than him? He's 20,000 people better than you. So you start saying, okay, Corinthians tells us not to compare ourselves among ourselves because that's ignorant. So then what happens is, you know, you look at all that stuff, and and people say, yeah, but we've got, we've got three services on Sunday and we've got 1,500 people in each service and we've got this, this, and this. And when you look at that, you just sit back and think, all y'all care about are numbers. That's not what we're looking at here. We meet for two reasons. Get people saved and bring them to the knowledge of the truth. That's our goal. That's who we are as ambassadors. That's what we're supposed to do. God's will is that all men be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Now, does that mean that God has a plan for what kind of vehicle you drive? Does that mean God has a plan for what kind of job you have? Does that mean God has a plan for what kind of um, house you own? Or if you own a house or if you rent? And, and that's what we, you, I'm brought up in that stuff. You know, we're brought up in that stuff and says, well, you know, if there was a young lady that I worked with back when I worked at Radio Shack, and she said, uh, she was asking me one day, she said, I'm, I'm trying to decide if I want to go to this Christian college or if I want to go to this thing. And she said, well, I'm just going to ask God about it. Okay. So she comes back and says, well, I was reading through, and my pastor was talking about Abraham and how God chose him to do this. And she said, I think that uh, through having a conversation with my pastor, I need to go to this Christian college. Six months later, she dropped out. So was that God's plan for her to go and drop out? Or was it just his plan for her to go? She did. So then, then you're thinking... And I've said it before, there was a lady that, that, our, that our school hired. There was a lady that our school hired, and everybody said, well, this is just a perfect fit. This is a God thing. God is the one that made sure that this happened. She quit before school started. So was it a God thing that he, that he brought this person into our, in our school and had her get this job and then leave? Is it all of a sudden now his will that she just showed up to leave? And you start thinking about that stuff, and you start putting that stuff together, and you're thinking, okay, that's not what God's doing today, because you go and you find out what God's doing is He wants people saved, and then people that are saved to come to the knowledge of the truth. The whole purpose of the church, the local assembly, you go it over in Ephesians, the whole, the whole reason that we're here is to get people saved, and then get those people perfected, which he's talking about here, and then the perfected saints go do the work of the ministry. Well, what's the work of the ministry? Get people saved to bring them to the knowledge of the truth. Pretty simple mission statement. Whatever capacity that looks like, if you do that, where whatever house you have, whatever car you drive, whatever job you have, if you're doing those two things, you're doing the will of God. It's that simple. Wherever you are, you do those two things, you're doing God's will. 
and 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 it's not that hard. And you you, you read this stuff, and it's it's just what this verse does in First Corinthians and clears up for us. What is it we're supposed to be preaching? Is this faith, right? We go and preach that body of doctrine. We're not back here preaching this body of doctrine. That's what right division does. It sets you free from all this stuff and says, I've given you everything right up front. All you need to do is just believe it. And that's that common faith that we see there. And it's that common faith that was hid in God. And we see that there is a particular time, that due time, that it was revealed to and through the Apostle Paul. And it's still yours. Um, but we, and when I say we, I'm not saying us. I'm saying as Christians, the, the, the larger majority of Christians, what they look at is the situations and circumstances that they're in. They look at that to see, is God doing this, that, or the other? When he's doing none of that stuff, and he's over here, and you think you're over here in the will of God, and his will's over here, and you're so far away from it that you don't even know what's going on. But they think that they can get there by, by certain things, right? Um, go over to Ephesians chapter 4. I can't remember if it was in... Ohio or North Carolina? I think it was North Carolina. I told them that I'd mention I'm going to build myself a little soapbox sometimes so I can stand up on it. But it was North Carolina, wasn't it? Ephesians chapter 4, verse 4. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 4. There's one body and one spirit, even as you are called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. How many faiths are there? How many faiths can you find out in the Scripture? Well, there's one back here that says if you are circumcised and you do the law and you do all that law, then you would have salvation for that nation of Israel. Then you've got this other one over here, this common faith that has to do with what Paul's doing. So which one do we go by? Well, if he says there's one faith, you find out who's got that one faith now. Paul, same thing with that one baptism. How many baptisms do we have back here? Technically seven, if you broke it down, you can get twelve, right? Over here, how many baptisms are there? One. Now, which one do you go by? You go back over to Matthew, where he's got three in one verse, and say, okay, well, which one do I want? Well, the third one you definitely don't want. <laughs> you, don't want to, you don't want to be baptized in fire, or baptized with fire. You don't want that one. Regardless of what Pentecost, they, that's just a misunderstanding of what that fire is. They think the fire is when they can speak in tongues. Well, it's just a misunderstanding of what's going on. So which one is it? Well, we've got this one baptism over here. Well, this one faith that Paul's talking about probably has to do with the one that we're looking at. 1 Timothy chapter 3. <clears throat> First Timothy chapter three, um, verse nine. Now, of course, First Timothy chapter three, and this is this is one of those things when you look at Titus. What Titus is going to do? Paul leaves Titus. He says, "I left thee in Crete." All right, and what he's going to do is he's going to set up local churches, and then what he does is he gives him some qualifications for the elders there, which is also the bishops, and we see the same thing here. Um, notice in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 8, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. He's talking here about the deacons. He says, Likewise must the deacons be grave, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy of filthy lucre, holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. All right, so we see that this faith that he's talking about there uh, goes along with that. But what I find interesting is where he says, holding the faith of, or the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. So then we think about what's going on. 
what's this faith come about by is that mystery that it was hidden God, right? So when you think about the mystery of the faith, um, it's what Paul's what Paul's teaching, right? First uh, Timothy chapter four. And of course, we could go through all of Paul's epistles. We did that a long time ago. He talks about it in every one of his epistles. But first, first Timothy chapter four, verse one, he says, "Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from what." Now, what happens is in churches, they'll say, well, you've got somebody that's saved, and what happens is they say, well, I don't longer want to be saved, so I'm going to depart from the faith, and I'm no longer going to be saying that I'm saved. They'll say, well, I no longer believe in Christ. Well, you, go, you drop down. Um, <clears throat> To 2 Timothy chapter 2 to kind of put this into perspective you know everybody always asks what happens if you believe and then you say well I no longer want to believe well notice in, in, in 2 Timothy chapter 2 um, verse start off in verse 10 he says therefore I endure all things for the elect's sake that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory it is a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. No question. There's a couple things in there where you're looking at verse 12 and people say, well, if you deny him, he's going to deny us. And what they do is they go back to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. says, well, if you deny me, for my father. That's not what he's talking about in this verse. Well, he's talking about that verse. He's saying, if we suffer, we shall also reign. If we deny him, he's talking to saved people. He says, if we deny him, he'll also deny us. Deny us what? Reigning. It's the context. If you keep on going. Verse 13 says, if we believe not. So you've got a saved person that says, well, I've, I decide I'm no longer going to believe. What's he say? Yet he abideth What? Who's abiding faithful? There is Christ. Yet he abideth faithful. He cannot deny himself. What happens is, is when you become a member of the church of the body of Christ, you are members in particular, what 1 Corinthians chapter 12 says, you become a part of the body of Christ. And for him to say that you're no longer part of the body of Christ, he would have to cut off part of his body. And that doesn't happen. So the moment that you believe, you're placed in the living union with Jesus Christ and you can't get out of it even if you wanted to. So the idea that people say that you can lose your salvation, what they don't understand is what God's doing today in the dispensation of the grace of God and He cannot deny Himself. The moment that you become part of Him, He cannot deny you. He abides faithful to whom? Himself. Now, if you say, I believed, but I no longer believe, that's a different question because did you really believe to begin with? We can have a conversation with that. But when we think about this, back over in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 4, it really does, right? So you have to kind of maneuver some stuff there. But Then what happens is, well, what did you believe? Well, did you believe that you walked an aisle and got saved? Well, then you weren't saved to begin with. Did you believe that you said a prayer and you got saved? Then you weren't, believe, you weren't saved to begin with because that prayer doesn't save you. You go over to John, you find out what? God heareth not the prayers of a sinner. Yeah. Think about that for a second. You've got people going around all the time saying, well, if you want to get saved, all you need to do is pray to God. Well, if you're a sinner and you're in sin, you're in Adam, God doesn't hear your prayers. That's what the verse says. That one hurts some people. So you've got unsaved people saying all the time, it's like, I prayed for this thing to happen. God didn't answer your prayer. God didn't hear your prayer because you're not saved. Well, I'll tell you what, you talk about that, you throw that verse out, people, people will fight you. Well, then you get to talk about what is it that you actually did to get saved. Well, I trusted in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That he died for my sins, was buried, and rose again the third day for my justification. Well, guess what? You can't get out even if you want to stop believing that. He's put you in. You're part of it already. 
And the only thing that means is you're going to be a name that's named. We talked about that a few weeks ago. You're still going to be there. You're going to have a whole bunch of wood, hay, and stubble that's going to burn up, but you're still going to be saved. That's not what he's talking about here in 1 Timothy chapter 4. He's not talking about somebody saying, well, I no longer want to believe. When he says here, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy and all that stuff. What he's talking about there is he's saying there are people that are teaching this information that I'm teaching today. When Paul's teaching this today, there are people that are teaching the faith, that body of truth that was delivered to Paul. And he says here that in the latter times some shall depart from that. They're going to stop teaching that. Do you know what they're going to start teaching? This over here. They're going to depart from what Paul's doing. They're going to say, well, Paul didn't have a unique apostleship. Paul's not the only one that talks about the rapture. And they're going to be over here, stuck over here, saying, well, if you tithe and you do this, that, and the other. What they're doing is they're departing from that faith and they're going over here and teaching this. That's what he's talking about in the passage. And you see that. Notice, giving heed to seducing spirits. You go back to Jeremiah 23, 25 through 40, you can find out a little bit about seducing spirits. And the doctrines and doctrines of devils, speaking in lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. And he goes down through and you see some of the stuff that he says that they're going to do. <clears throat> what they do is they depart from this and then they go over here and start teaching this stuff. Or they stop teaching that and then they just stop teaching it all. That's what he's talking about, departing from the faith. They depart from that body of truth that was delivered to and through the Apostle Paul. That means at one time they were teaching and preaching Paul's gospel. And then they stopped. That's what he's talking about there. Um, and you see this. Go over to chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6. Really? Then they become Christian atheists, yeah. Or they become Baptisationalist. Is that the word we came up with? Baptisationalist. Well, I really want to be a, a dispensationalist, but I'm, I still want to be a Baptist, and that's fine. Yeah, we, 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 we came up with that one, I think. Baptisationalists. Where did you say to go? Chapter 6, 1 Timothy chapter 6. <clears throat> um. Let's look at um, verse 7. Well, verse 6 says, But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be therewith content. But they that will be rich. Now I want you to notice that. You notice that word, but they that will be rich? He's not talking about people that are rich. He's talking about people who will to, who want to, who desire to be rich. That their will is so stuck on, I want to be rich. All right, and that's why he says, um, you know the verse where he says, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. That's the same will there, that you desire to be godly, that you desire to do this. And it's not the ones that actually do it, because guess what? We don't do it. But if we desire to live godly, then we shall suffer persecution. That's what, it's the same will that we desire, that our will is there, that we want to do this. Well, that's the same thing he says here. But they that will be rich, the ones that chew, that, they, that their life is so filled with, I want to be rich. That's what he's talking about here. Fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. And you think about that, just that phrasing. We've not, we've not even got to the verse that I want to yet, but you think about that. What happens when your desires are so much outside, you know, I, I just I want to be rich at all costs. And that's really what he's talking about here. What, what happens to them? They fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts what do those foolish and hurtful lusts do? They drown men in destruction and perdition. 
when you drown, and you think about this, <clears throat> if you're getting in wa if you get in water and you don't know how to swim, do you know which way's up? You start kicking around and you think it. Do you know which way's up? You think so? If your head's underwater, you might That's what I'm saying. If you're in water, you're underwater, you're drowning, would you know which way's up? Which way's left? Which way's right? Would you be able to figure out exactly where did I come from? That's why I'm. That's why I'm saying. Like, if you're drowning, you're like you're panicking, and you have no idea how to swim, and you're just splashing around. And you think about, think about that. That's what. He, that's what he's talking about. Where which drown men in destruction and perdition. You don't know what's right, what's wrong. You're just. You're just so far down that you just. And that. That's what happens. But notice, for the love of money is the root of all evil. You know, that that's one of those misquoted verses. There's a there's a series that I'd like to do one day. It says the Bible doesn't say that. That's that's one of those. Um, money's the root of all evil. That's not what that verse says. It's the love of money. It's the desire to follow and 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 have your desire put on that all I want to do is get money. You look at our culture today, especially young people, especially young people that are poor in urban areas, what they say is, I want to get my money. Their, their whole life is, you got to get money. Money's going to fix it. There you go. But as Puffy says, mo money, mo problems, right? But that's 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 what our that's what our culture has become is I want to get as much money. That's what it's all about money. Churches would teach that. No, no, I know. I know. Yeah, no, I know. And that's that when I and I've said this before, if you look at a lot of the problems that we have out in in our country especially it's because the churches, it's coming from the churches. But I mean, th that's, you know, what were you going to say when I said that about the Bible doesn't say that? Uh, a, a guy that I work with that I've mentioned here before, Jerry, mm -hmm. he is uh, Alex's stepdad. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He said, yeah, you ought, to, you ought to tell your uh, preacher, you ought to do a series on that. <laughs> and there you go. It's a gospel. Yeah, yeah. Um, but no, you it's like the... that you would say that yeah. uh, so randomly. <clears throat> the, uh, you know the verse where it said, where everybody says, you know where the verse it says where the lion's going to lay down with the lamb? Oh, yeah. There is no verse in Scripture that right. says that. I don't know. That's a good idea. Oh, I like that. Yeah. That's a good idea. Man, there's so many good ideas. Lions and lambs are not natural enemies. No, no. Yeah. Um, but you know, you think about that stuff. <clears throat> but that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, people say it. Yeah. A lot of people just say stuff and like it's in the Bible somewhere yeah. and it's yeah. nowhere to be found. Yeah, it's right next to, you know, where it says, uh, first opinion. Is next to godliness. Yeah, first first opinion, chapter one, verse three. Yeah. yeah. It's not in there. Yeah. But I mean, you know, you look at this verse and that's one of those they say the root the um, money is the root of all evil, that's what they say. But it says, For the love of money 
is the root of all evil. It's, yeah. it's the desire to follow that and that alone and make that your priority. That's what, that's what he says is the root of all evil. Notice which he says, well, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the truth or from the faith, right? Uh, and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. <clears throat> you know, how many times have I heard um, people that are rich that they're, they get everything that they thought they wanted and they're just, miserable. they're miserable. Yeah. There's a guy, um, and I've, I've played him for you before, NF, the guy, and I, was, and I showed Michael a few years ago, let him listen to him. That's his, his latest album that he came out with. He's, he's, a, he's a Christian rapper, if you want to call it that. Um, but his, his last album, he came out and he said last year he was struggling with suicide. And he said, I wanted to kill myself because I had the number one album, the number one song. I'm doing, doing all these concerts that are sold out everywhere I go is doing all this stuff. And he said, that's, that's what my goal was. And I've reached it. And he said, I'm not fulfilled. He says, I'm miserable. And he got all the stuff that he said he wanted to get. And he's miserable. And I'm thinking, well, the reason why is because you're following this. And you're, you've pierced yourself through with many sorrows. And it's just, instead of just saying, hey, I'm completing Christ. And let's just go do some stuff with that. It's this constant, I want to get this thing and this thing and this thing. And once you get it all, you're like, it wasn't that hard, so I want to get this thing, this, and you're never, you're never, you're never satisfied. And you're not content. And that's why he says here, with food and raiment, therewith be content. And he says, godliness with contentment's great gain. Well, where do you find the doctrine of godliness is in Paul's epistles, right? And you find out some things about what, what is it that we need? We need food and clothing. That's it. It says, be content with what you have. Do our house, you've all been to it, it's small. Do we need eight, eight bedroom, four bathroom? Well, we might need more than, we might need some more bathrooms. But Delilah's like, there's more mirrors in the house than this one. She said that this morning. I'm like, no, that's all right. Well, we'd only, she said, there's more than just one mirror in this house. I was in the bathroom doing my hair and it takes me 13 seconds to do my hair and our bathroom is really small yeah she doesn't take up as much room but you know you sit and think about that we could have we we probably could have looked for a house that's bigger but why we do and it's it's nice and it, it's perfect for us now I do wish we had one more room maybe but it's who cares? You can do anything you want down there. You would think so, but when it's really, really cold downstairs, oh, yeah, it's yeah. really, really cold. Because uh, when I had our computer and stuff downstairs, when we'd do that, I would have to wrap up in a jacket and a blanket to be able to do anything down there. Um, but we've moved it upstairs again. But, but, you know, when we think about that, everybody wants everything now. And if I don't get it, then... I was telling a guy the other day, a girl in my, she comes in before school starts. She's sitting in my classroom and she starts crying. I'm like, what's wrong? She's like, they've added a upcoming titles thing on Netflix. She's crying because they've added the tab on the Netflix app that shows titles that they're going to release soon. And she's crying about that. There, there's, there's something wrong there. But that's, you know, you think about that, and you're like, all right. Yeah, you're like. You know, geez. anyway. Oh, wow. <clears throat> it's okay. So go back, to, go back to Titus real quick. <clears throat> and I'm not going to say much about this just because it's, it's one of those things that, that, I, that I find it's it's really interesting um, that that we that we see this, you know. In in, in Paul's epistles, he says um, 
grace and peace, right? So when we look here in, in Titus chapter 1, verse 4, it says, to, to Titus, my own son, after the common faith. So we understand that that's that body of truth that was, that was committed to the Apostle Paul. Uh, that included the ministry, the, 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 wor the, the word of reconciliation, that, mi that mystery or that ministry that we have. It, has, it contains that mystery and it contains the, the, the dispensation of the grace of God and all the stuff that goes along with that, the rapture of the church, the spiritual blessings that we have in heavenly places, that faith that was delivered to and through the Apostle Paul. That's that common faith, right? But then he says, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ our Savior. Now, one of the things that's, that, that I find really interesting about that. Um, those those three epistles, I mean, you even go over to Philemon. Um, Philemon chapter 1, it's only one chapter. Verse 3, Philemon verse 3. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ. So again, he says grace and peace, right? Not grace, mercy, and peace. So the only time that he uses grace, mercy, and peace is in the three epistles right here. 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus. Now, you could take... You could take something with this. Who's he writing those epistles to? Not just not just Titus and, and, and Timothy, but who's he writing the epistles to? People who are going to lead in a local assembly. And what does what does somebody need that runs a local assembly more than most anything else would be what? That mercy. You know, when you think about, and we're going to talk about the things that we have here. If you go over to 1 Timothy chapter 3. Um, and it's only found in those three books. But 1 Timothy chapter 3, and this is, this is one of those things. Um, and I've said this before. When, when I was younger and I didn't know anything, when Delilah and I first got, got married and we were in the church that we were in, um, I told people, I said, I think that I, I'm, I feel like I'm called to preach because I said that because I thought that's what I was supposed to say. There was no time in my life where I, where I had some strange feeling come over me and say, you're going you're gonna to preach. <clears throat> so the idea that people say, well, God's called me to preach, what they're doing is, and of course, like I said, I just did it because I thought that's what I was supposed to say. Um, but normally what happens is, is we, we put those people up on a pedestal thinking, well, there's something special. And which is why, you know, Jim Baker and all the stuff that, that took place with him and Tammy Faye and all that stuff back in the 80s and, and all that stuff, that's why all those things were kind of a shock. We're like, this person's supposed to be a godly person because that comes over from that Catholicism that this person's a priest and they're, they're called by God and they're supposed to do something. They're supposed to be better than everybody else. Um, and that's just not the case. Um, when you look at 1 Timothy chapter 3, it says, This is a true saying. If a man... What's that next word? Does it say called? If a man called? It says, If a man what? Desire the office of a bishop. What happens is, is somebody, you can't force somebody to be a preacher, or a bishop in this case. You can't force somebody to be... A leader of a local assembly it has to be something that that person has a genuine desire to do it and that's one reason why for a long time I stopped doing stuff because I didn't want it to be connected to where I said I felt like I was called because I didn't feel that way I said it because I thought I was supposed to um, but then I look at this and this verse this is what it is <clears throat> Which is why, you know, we've, I was talking to Charlie McQuillan the other day on the phone. We were talking about this, and, and he was asking me some stuff about he's going through the school, and he's in the third year now. And, and he said, you know, I want to I wanna do this study, continue doing this study on Friday nights. And, and so we're talking about that. And I said, you know, what happens is a lot, of, a lot of times guys will get to about the second year, about halfway through the second year, and they just want to go and start doing stuff, start a group teach, preach, whatever. Um, because what happens is the, the Word starts producing stuff and you desire to go do it. And then they stop going through the school and they don't finish it up. And that third year is really the one that's most important. Um, 
But that's what it comes comes to. Notice he says, if a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. Um, and again, I'm not saying that, that everybody needs mercy, but one of the things that, because everybody, everybody's got it. Um, everybody has the mercy. I mean, you go through and you, you go through Paul's epistle and you find that. That's, that's, I find it interesting that that word mercy is put into First, Second Timothy, and then Titus. Those three that are written to the, the people that are going to lead a local assembly. <clears throat> one, of, one of the things is Ted and I were going through the uh, Hall of Fame, the Christian Hall of Fame up there. You're going through and you got Charles Spurgeon, you got uh, D.L. Moody, and you got all these other guys that's that's gone on before, and um, it, it goes all the way back to um, I can't remember his name now. Anyway, so they go they go throughout history, and they've got these these paintings and little things off to the side. And you're going through and you walk through this whole thing. You're looking at this person did this and this person did this and this person started the Dallas Theological Seminary, which used to be a dispensational Bible college and it's no longer a Bible college anymore. It's more of a liberal thing. Anyway, um, you look at all these things and then it's, it's really neat because Ted said, you know, you go through this with Richard Jordan. He's like, well, this person um, taught this person um, this thing and, and this person... But you see, like these guys that came out from underneath um, J.C. O'Hare's ministry, and they're up there, but they've left the faith. They're one of those over in Timothy. <clears throat> so you're going through all this stuff, and the very last one you get to was probably the neatest one, and it's, and it's really cool because it, it was it was a it was a painting, and the name of the person was unknown Christian. And what it was, it said this was this was to all the, the lay people in the church, in the local assembly. And and I say this, and Delilah said it earlier, but I would say this. What we do here now wouldn't happen if you all weren't here, honestly. The conferences that we've had wouldn't happen if you all weren't here doing this stuff. People online, all that stuff, everybody, if, if you all weren't here, there would be nothing. Inclu yeah, including Ronnie and all the folks online. You know, this wouldn't happen if it hadn't been for you all. Um, so when I saw that, I was like, that's really neat that they did that. And it's just, what we do here doesn't happen if you all aren't here. And I, that, and I was like, that's, that's really neat that they did that. You can toss all the other guys away because really, that's that's the church. That's the local church. That's what happens. Um, and I was like, that's that's really neat that they actually did that. Uh, at first, it was kind of like unknown because I just saw the title and it said unknown Christian. I was like, that's kind of weird. Then I looked at the what they had written on there. I was like, okay, it makes sense now. Um, so I mean, it's one of those things. I appreciate you all showing up um, all the time here and and online too. So. Um, <clears throat> So like I said, I wasn't going to say much about the, the grace, mercy, and peace. There's really nothing outside or anything else that would, that would give us any information to that. I just find it interesting that it's, it's to Timothy and Titus you know, um, think, as you go through there. I, I think it's great that we have people like Ronnie and R.L. every week. Mm -hmm. sitting in here yeah but the fact that then they also take time out of their lives to come yeah every once in a while to be here so yeah that's some good guys right there yeah yeah lisa jameson she's on a lot she shares our videos yeah kim and trey do you know you think about you think about that extension to the rest of the world um, it's just it's just mind boggling that we get that we're we get our uh, western Kentucky delegates yeah 
Yeah. Jeffrey and all them. Eastern Kentucky and Western Kentucky. Yeah. Jeffrey and all them. Um, you know, the folks, folks, I mean, you know, you, you find out more and more there's people, a guy south of Louisville that has a prison ministry. He's going in teaching right division in a prison over there. You've got the folks that came up to the conference from London, Kentucky. Um, another group that, that's contacted us from Ashland, they commented on one of our videos on YouTube and says, um, are you talking about Moorhead, Kentucky? And I posted, I said, yeah. So there's a woman over in Ashland that might try and come over to Moorhead sometimes. See, in Mount Sterling, which is over that way. So there's, there's people in the state that we didn't know about that we're finding out about, honestly, through, through this, through that extension. Um, but it's just, it's just amazing when you sit back and think, you know, had, you know, you talked about it before, had you all not come across our website, we wouldn't be here. And if you hadn't come across Rodney's video, then we wouldn't be, you know, all those little things. Well, I worded it really awkwardly. Yeah. It, it sounded it, it, yeah. Everybody kind of just laughed about it. We all knew oh, what it I was. I found so. somebody. Yeah. That's what it was. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's like I was online and I found somebody. So that's how I missed that. But what's amazing is y'all are still here. And I'm confident you have been wherever you are. You have been here. Yeah. And that's what I've said. That's what I've said before. Do you know how easy it would have been for us to just go to a Baptist church before you all contacted us? And I mean, we could have just gone. We would have been miserable and have been like, "Why are you teaching that this way and whatever?" But miserable, huh? Especially when you're miserable. Yeah. When you don't know it, you don't know your no. Yeah. But when you know it, and then you try to sit there and listen to the side of your tongue. Yeah. Yeah. Um. But I mean, and then here we are, yeah, and so here we are five years later, two years in this building, Bruce is about to be here for two years, I mean, we would have not gotten hold of Bruce had, had David not got a hold of you, so I mean, you, you think about all that stuff, just because we put stuff out there, you just never know who's going to see it. Oh, that's another thing, and that's another thing, and I do remember saying this. You don't realize who's out there watching, you know, whether it's you or Alan. I think I yeah. use Alan as, a, as an example. You guys just throw your videos up, you know, hoping, hoping it sticks with different people. And somebody, it may be life changing, and you'll never, never know. know. Yeah. Because it's they'll see, far away you know, something. okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, I never talked to Rodney, mm -hmm. but his video is the one that got us. Yeah. He watched him a lot. Actually. And but I never, I never called up Rodney and said, "Hey, man, I appreciate your video. You know, you changed my way of thinking. I mm -hmm. see the Bible for what it is, and not for what somebody in a seminary is telling me." I never, I didn't, never talked to him. Yeah. So he's never gonna. Well, he will now. Cause he does now because we told him. But yeah. But yeah, there's there could be fifty or hundred people out there that that, yeah. that may be, you know, on the other side of the country. Mm -hmm together with people and you'll never know. Yeah. Um, and that, that, that kind of puts things in, pers in perspective, right? Um, it's just, just yeah, yeah. You would like to know that you had that much of an impact on somebody's life. And life's not fair and you're not always going to know. Yeah, well, the cool thing is, is we don't even do it for that reason, but it happens. Yeah. You know? We we didn't decide, huh? Yeah, the word takes care of itself. I mean, the fact the reason we do the lives cuz Ronnie asked us if we could do it, and then, you know, that's that's the reason that we did live. And then we were meeting all these people through and you know, like Lisa and and Kim and Trey and and RL, they'll they'll get on it. And, and, you know, it's just you don't do it to go reach people but you reach people just because you do the work and yeah 
Yeah. Oh, I know every one of those people online would be here if they live close yeah. every day. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and that, that's, that's really, that's really the fascinating part about when you just sit back and think, you know, you just go and, and do the work and let God's word do, do what it's designed to do. And, and then we get a benefit from that because of that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So. <clears throat> yeah. 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 Um, but yeah, that's that's just that's just one of those things you just sit back and think. Yeah, I'm glad to be back. That that has a lot to do with it yeah. too. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so I'm gonna stop there. Uh, we'll pick up at verse five, uh, going in through uh, why he's why why Paul's leaving him at Crete to do some things. Uh, and then we'll take a look at that, and then First and Second Timothy to 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 go along with it. So, what well, what I want to do is to be able to to study First and Second Timothy along with Titus as we do this, so they can kind of mesh together and and whatnot. So, all right, any comments, questions, concerns? What? Yeah, I know. She's pretty awesome, isn't she? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Please go with the idea of the Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. 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 The the spiritual malnutrition thing. What you know, I've years ago I thought of this idea. You've got an anemic church out there in the world. One of the reasons that they that they have that because they're anemic is because they've got a book that doesn't even have the blood in it. And I've thought about that one before too, and that goes along with what you're talking about, the spiritual malnutrition. You've got a lot of sickly people out there in the world who are going to churches every Sunday and they're they're not even getting milk, much less meat. I mean, yeah. So I mean, you know, that idea, so uh, we've got a bunch of them, but we'll see. Yeah, I mean, you know, I thought about the um, where it's 2020 next year. Our our theme verse is Ephesians 3 9 to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery. Well, 2020 vision, you know, the sight and all that stuff goes together. So there's just way too many. Man, I'm giving all these ideas out online, and everybody's going to take now. So. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, he said he. Yeah, ours is, ours comes first. So, anyway, um, but yeah, I mean, there's there's all kinds of ideas, and and hopefully we're hopefully we're around long enough we can use all the ideas, and if we're not, then that's all right because that means we're going to be gone anyway. So, uh, but we'll pick up verse five next week and uh, Wednesday night. Um, as long as nobody's in this room, we're going to be here, um, and then we'll start Matthew on Wednesday night because that seems to be the consensus uh, of that so I don't know we'll see All right, <clears throat> Father we thank you for the opportunity that we have to study your word and uh, to fellowship together around your word uh, again our, our hope and prayer is that we allow your word to be the final authority in all things that it's not what we think or what we what we feel about it but what your word actually says that we would just by faith trust in what you say and allow your word to do the work that you've designed it to do, uh, that it might produce your life in and through us, that we might be to the praise and honor and glory of your Son and, in, and your grace. And it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen.